The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. We're pleased to have with us Senator Ryan McDougall. Good to see you, sir. Thank you for having me, Woody. Glad to be here. Uh, how are things going on in your district? We've had some tough economic times over the past several years. How has your district fared? Well, I think the people of my district, it's very diverse. We have uh, some areas that are more urban in the Hanover direction and some that are more urban in the Spotsylvania direction. And then it stretches all the way to the northern neck, which is a lot of rural areas. So it's a very diverse district. People are hardworking. They spend a lot of energy to make sure that they get their jobs done. But the economic climate has been difficult, particularly with the impacts from sequestration and some federal policy decisions. It has made some negative impacts in parts of King George and Spotsylvania, where Fort AP um, and Caroline, where Fort AP Hill and Dahlgren, where um, in King George, are located. So we've had some challenges, but uh, people are innovative and they're working hard. On the state direction, that we've tried to be innovative as well, and as challenges have been presented from the federal government, we're trying to do things to spur the economy or at least give opportunities for people to do things to spur the economy throughout the district. Tell us a little bit more about those challenges. As I understand it, the Commonwealth has 44 military install installations in the Pentagon. You mentioned one in your district, but that dependence has to stop, does it not? Well, I, I think certainly the federal policies we're going to have to react to. We have no control over the direction the federal government takes, but we can be smarter and wiser about uh, what we rely upon. So we try to do things that encourage companies, not only throughout the United States, but internationally, to locate their operations here. We've been pretty aggressive about creating those opportunities. But we also want to make a climate so that existing companies and individuals can start new businesses and that the climate is opening and welcoming for them to do that. So we have tried to create a regulatory environment in Virginia that is open. We have challenges every day. The EPA is pushing down new regulations for air quality, pushing down new water quality regulations. Some of those are extremely important to make sure we have good uh, and healthy environment, good and healthy bay, but it is frustrating at times because Virginia has been aggressive about instituting policies, having a clean bay. Other states to our north have not shown the, the same willingness to help protect those natural resources, and Virginia citizens get punished as a result. So we're working to try to correct some of those inequities. Talk to us about your committee assignments and how they help your constituents. Also, your leadership positions. You chair the Rules Committee in the Senate, and you also head up the Senate Republican Caucus. Well, on the Senate side, uh, there's 40 members, and so we all have a number of committees. I'm chairman of the Rules Committee, which determines all the appointments that the Senate has is in charge of making. We also look at anything that doesn't fit a normal policy direction of another committee. So there's a, a lot of unusual things that come to the Rules Committee. I'm on the Courts of Justice Committee, and uh, we're meeting this morning, and we take up a wide range of issues, some that are in important to Virginians overall, like missing persons, making sure we have good policies and directions, and some that are very nuanced and intricate and only affect very small portions of the code. On the Senate Finance Committee, we've been spending a lot of time in finance. There have been many late nights as we've tried to dealt with our financial situation. It looks today like we are doing a little bit better, but a little bit better does not take into account the fact that we had to cut almost two and a half billion dollars out of the the budget from the state. It has gotten a little bit better and we'll probably be able to put back three or four hundred thousand. 
Um, so that helps out, but it still creates some, some challenges. Some particular challenges have been in the public safety sector, sector, making sure that we're taking care of our law enforcement officers, sheriff's deputies, and state troopers. That has been a real challenge as we've gone forward. And then I'm on the transportation committee, which we deal with a lot of transportation policy and direction. In previous years, that has been a uh, very challenging committee. This year, we do have some policy decisions, but it's not as intricate as previous years. And then I'm also on the Rehab and Social Services Committee, and we deal with everything from policy of community services boards to policies at Department of Corrections to alcohol policy. And that's one of the areas I've been really working hard on this year. We started looking at, or we've been looking at for dating back to Governor Wilder, our ABC direction and how that That's entity, the Alcoholic Bever Beverage Control Board. And in Virginia, um, it is all goes through one entity. So if it's liquor, it's sold at a state store. And if it's, if it's beer, wine, it goes through a another system. But the, there's been efforts to privatize the entire mm -hmm. system. There's been efforts to, to make it run more like a business. But for 20 some years, those efforts have failed. But right now, um, as of Friday afternoon, my bill passed heading to the governor's desk that would take ABC out of uh, direct executive branch agency, move it to be an authority so it could operate more like a business, can make decisions on purchasing and locations of uh, stores more like a business, but still put into protections to make sure that we're keeping a watchful eye out o over the law enforcement arm to make sure that they're doing things in a professional and direct nature. And I'm very excited that for the first time it looks like we're going to be restructuring ABC and actually moving it forward to operate more like a business. Congratulations on that. Now, once the, the governor, governor has to sign it, so we're not there yet. <laughs> but assuming he signs it, will there be a transition period? Yeah, we're a transition <coughs> period. It won't go into full effect until 2018. It sounds like it'd be a simple maneuver, but there are lots of complicated directions from who owns the IT systems and having them switched over to personnel to just we have to iron out some discussions with the governor about whether the board members will be full or part-time. But uh, I think preliminary discussions look good, and I'm very optimistic we'll get there. Uh, back to the budget. I understand that K through 12 will be held harmless. There are some uh, legislation that will ameliorate the, the effects of uh, tuition increases at our institution of, institutions of higher learning. I understand there's a pay raises for, for teachers, state and local employees, and law enforcement. We, you know, with the budget challenges, we're trying to do two things. Make sure that we're spending the citizens' money wisely, because I think it's really important that we remember it's not the legislature's money, it's not the governor's money, it's the citizens of Virginia's money, and we're trying to spend that in a cautious and wise direction. Education is the top priority of Virginians, and in our budget, we've held it as a top priority. But one of the areas that we've had to really fight for is law enforcement over a number of administrations going back that has not been a top priority and we've tried to make it one in this budget. But we've also tried to make sure we're looking out for our employees. We have had very few pay raises on the state side over the years and we are coming to an agreement with the House to try to put one in place that I think that the governor will support at the end of the day. So we're trying to make sure we're rewarding our current employees that have not gotten pay raises, trying to make sure that we're spending money wisely and focus on the important directions. But it takes a lot of effort. I chair the Public Safety Subcommittee and we deal with National Guard, um, law enforcement, sheriff, state police, emergency management, and there are very difficult decisions that we have to make with all those, including Department of Corrections. And we've been trying to make sure that we're balancing safety and the ability to respond by those first responders and uh, making sure we don't spend too much money. And that's a real challenge. Now, what about the rainy day fund? Has it been replenished? With the new revenues, we are be being very prudent. We're putting additional money back into the Virginia retirement system to make mm -hmm. sure we don't have that continuing ongoing, uh, ongoing unpaid expense out there. So we've 
put an additional large sum of money, close to $50 million, and we'll might be increased a little bit as we go through negotiations. We're also um, recommending that we put in place over $100 million in additional extra money into the rainy day fund, and that could go up a little bit as well. So as we're getting some of the new revenue projections in, we're trying to take a significant portion of those revenue upticks and put them into either the rainy day fund or the retirement system that is mm -hmm. an ongoing obligation. So we do not have those just dangling out there that we have not funded. Now, public safety and law enforcement has been a passion of yours since you were at least a prosecutor. And I know there's a, there's a bill dealing with a DNA registry database. Yeah, well, there's, law enforcement is, I think, extremely important for everybody to be educated, to have good jobs. They need to live in safe environments. And so we have to make sure that we're protecting people. But we also have to make sure that we're protecting people's rights as well. There's a bill that is moving through the House and Senate relating to uh, the ability of individuals to get information about people who committed violent sexual offenses. We have the sex offender registry, which is in place, but that starts in 1996. And actually an individual that lived outside of my district but uh, had challenges bringing his, his perpetrator, his, uh, his, the perp person who violated him, to justice. And it was a lengthy and problematic road. But once he got there, he wanted to have in place the ability for others to find out if somebody had committed a violent sexual act prior to 1996. So we have put in place a historic um, sex offender registry, so it'll just list out the name of the person, where they were convicted in, in the jurisdiction in which, they, in which they were convicted in the crime of which they were convicted, and individuals will be able to go and look at that list. It will not be the same as the registry, but it'll be a, a place where you can one stop and look at all that information. And hopefully that'll help protect some additional individuals out there that they won't uh, unwittingly be associating with people who have uh, committed violent sexual offenses in the past. Now what about expanding the DNA database to those who commit serious misdemeanors? Well there's, there is an effort and that's working through the process. The, this came out of the, the case in Charlottesville and the defendant Jesse Matthews who's working through the criminal process now. Originally there was an effort to try to include the offense he had once been convicted of, trespass into a DNA database. But th some of us had some real privacy concerns about including too many misdemeanors. You can do something serious like be charged with breaking and entering and have that reduced to a trespass mm -hmm. and be convicted of that. But you could do something as simple as drive into the parking lot of a public building after hours and be convicted of trespass. And so I and others had some concerns. So the list of offenses that came out include things like stalking, violating mm -hmm. a protective order, um, peeping, and the one or two others uh, unauthorized use of a motor vehicle that had a high correlation to the commission of other violent offenses in the future. So we really tried to be very focused and, and specific about the items that were included in that list, and the list is smaller than when it uh, was first proposed, which it, is the way the process should look through. So there will be some misdemeanors, but it is a very limited list and we try to limit it to items that for the most part had a fairly predictive uh, indication of other violent behavior in the future. Now turning our attention to your service on the Transportation Committee, uh, the bill that was passed a couple of years ago to create more funding for transportation is being implemented. Uh, and there are now priorities in place in terms of what projects get funded. There's al there are also directions, I believe, to the Commonwealth Transportation Board to set forth criteria about projects. Talk to us about that. Well, I voted against that bill, but it did pass, and we need to make sure that as we spend the money of the individuals, of people, that we do it in a wise and prudent way. So that bill just came over to the Senate a couple days ago, actually, and we've been looking very closely to make sure that we're putting our transportation dollars into priority areas, dealing with congestion, dealing with uh, interstate travel, dealing with areas where we have real problems with 
traffic because if you deal with some of those problematic areas, it can alleviate problems throughout the entire system. So we're working through that process now. We had a subcommittee of transportation met for a long time on Thursday night. We're continuing their discussions and reviewing their work and we'll take it up this week in the transportation committee and hopefully we'll have a good product that will focus where those transportation dollars go so that they will be used in the best and highest use. Uh, you, you mentioned congestion. I understand uh, mitigation of congestion is, is a high priority, but economic development as well. And I believe uh, we have to look at the return on investment now. Well, it, whenever we're looking at spending taxpayers' money, we have to be wise in how we're doing it. So government tries to deal with things in the best best direction. So when we're looking at transportation, congestion is the top priority, but in certain parts of the state, congestion is not the challenges that they deal with. Certainly in parts of my district, rural areas, economic development is just as important transportation purpose as congestion. So we're trying to balance those items as we go through the budget and, and deal with the transportation dollars as it works through the system. It is challenging. There are certain parts of the state where their entire focus is congestion. Certain parts of the state, the entire focus is economic development for transportation. So how do we bring those two together to create and a state entirely focused is a challenging uh, project. And we're, I think we're getting close. And so I'm optimistic over the next two weeks of session we'll be able to complete that task. No. What kind of transportation issues do you have in, in your district? You talked about it being part urban and part rural, but, but what kinds of needs do you see there? In my district, because there's a lot of water, um, one of the challenges is making sure that bridges are safe and when you go across them. The Norris Bridge there that moves mm -hmm. between West Point and uh, Whitestone, I mean between uh, or Middlesex and Whitestone, and then we have the Tappahannock Bridge that connects the Northern Neck. Those, making sure those infrastructures are safe and operational is absolutely key. But we have a lot of challenges. Uh, Spotsylvania, King George, Caroline, that area is growing exponentially and making sure that people can do the things they've come to expect and enjoy, get their kids to and from school, get to the grocery store, and get to work is a challenge while making sure we're putting in place the transportation items that uh, commerce can move as well. Those are, those are the challenges that we continually deal with. Um, and so we try to balance them as we go forward, but it is a challenge. Now, you, you, you had to deal with a, with a pretty novel issue in terms of transportation this session. Uh, talk to us about the competing interests that confronted you when Uber and Lyft, one of the new transportation network companies, decided it wanted to do business in the Commonwealth. Woody, I think I spent a tremendous amount of time dealing with that issue, and it was shocking to me. It's not one that uh, I had ever personally looked at prior to it coming in front of the legislature, but technology as it advances and people are creative, created a system where you can have an app on your telephone or iPad or tablet that you can call a regular person to come and pick you up and take you wherever you want to go. Traditionally, we had just used taxi cabs or or, or what we call limo companies or transport companies to do that work. And we put in a number of safeguards and protections. So if an individual was involved in an accident or to ensure that they were not uh, convicted of a serious violent crime, those types of protections in place. With this new companies coming in with the technology creativity, we did not have those same protections for the public. So trying to balance the new technologies coming in and making sure the public is protected but not uh, giving a competitive advantage over existing companies was the challenge and we worked through that and we spent countless hours in transportation committee trying to get it right and I think we we ma managed to make sure nobody was a hundred percent happy so we probably did a pretty good job good now let's turn our attention to schools especially our institutions of higher learning and uh, our community colleges uh, talk to us about the, the funding levels there and what's being done to try to ameliorate the cost of higher tuitions. Well, particularly in, in our area, community colleges are absolutely vital. We have some great public and private institutions from University of Mary Washington to Randolph-Macon 
but Germana and Rappahannock Community Colleges are absolutely key to making sure that our kids have the best education going forward. But not just our kids, but people learning new skills, adults coming back to get degrees. Community colleges are vital. We've really tried to work on the financial side to make sure that community colleges are having the resources they need to operate. It is cheaper to operate a community college, so it is better use of resources from the state. But we also look to make sure that we are increasing financial aid at community colleges in particular to make sure that individuals who needed help financially to go to school were able to get that, that help. So we've had a real focus on community colleges and we have some great uh, community college presidents in our area, Dr. Sam at, uh, at uh, Germana and Dr. Crowther at Rappahannock and they've been great partners as we've worked going forward with those two institutions. Now I understand there, there's a move afoot to cap fees at the institutions of higher learning, especially in terms of athletics, so that those who want a very bare bones education can get it. That's number one. Number two, I think there's a bill that would create a flat fee. Uh, so talk to us about those. We have, it's all universities in Virginia are different. We have some universities like University of Virginia and Virginia Tech who make a tremendous amount of revenue off their athletic programs and thus their fees are very low that goes to athletics. Then there's some institutions that do not and we are trying to make sure that the individuals attending those inf institutions have the ability to choose or be protected from having to pay large sums of money for those athletic programs. So those bills are working through the Senate right now and we're trying to make sure that we do it in a prudent and reasonable manner. Some decisions have already been made and we need to find the best way to mitigate those decisions that were made at the university direction for the students attending there and make sure that they don't make some of those decisions again in the future going forward. Now you talked about workforce development in terms of its importance to young students, uh, 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 elderly, and, and also those who may have lost their jobs due to the recession. Talk to us about the importance to returning veterans. Well, it's, veterans are, have done a great service to each one of us. They have given up a part of their lives to either protect us domestically or, or internationally from threats and give us the opportunity to live in the free country we have we need to make sure that when they re-enter the workforce that the tools are there for them to be able to educate in the areas where there are economic opportunities, job opportunities, and to get the skills needed for the workforce. And so we've been working very hard and a lot of that comes through our community college system and that has been a great, great opportunity. We've also had some programs and opportunities through the Division of Motor Vehicles with transportation companies that are looking for um, highly motivated, qualified individuals. So we've really had some great programs through DMV to get jobs for our veterans as well. Together, those coordinated efforts, I think Virginia, even though we have a tremendous number of veterans that live here, still has the most opportunities for, for veterans that we've put in place. And we're really excited about the uh, opportunities that are continuing to be out there and will be in the future. Is there a way for a returning veteran, for instance, to get credit for the experience that he or she has had overseas? Well, we've been working with our institutions to, if they've developed a skill or some specialty when they come to an institution mm -hmm. to try to be able to take that skill or specialty and turn that into to credit. So creating those systems are very challenging, but we've been working to try to put those opportunities in place. And of course, the, the Commonwealth has the V3 program, Virginia Values Veterans. And as I understand it, the budget now includes funding for a couple of uh, veteran service centers, one in the Hampton Roads area and one in Northern Virginia. We've, unfortunately, the federal government has not been as aggressive about providing those services for veterans as promised. So we've been trying to do what we can from the state level to increase the opportunities or cr increase the access for veterans. And so we have put in funding to move Virginia up on the list so we could potentially get two new veteran service centers, one in Northern Virginia and one in Hampton Roads. Great. Uh, local school budget uh, transparency. I know that uh, there, there, there's a move to require local school boards to uh, get their budgets out to the public. You know, I, constituents throughout the year come to us with 
ideas and suggestions. One of those that came to us was in reference to local school budgets. In Virginia, we put the entire state budget online, and any individual can go and read it line for line and see what they like or don't like. That same level of specificity is not in existence for local school budgets. So we're passing uh, legislation. It's moved from the Senate to the House now that would require that specificity of the line items of local school budgets to be posted online so everybody can see where we're spending our money in, in each county and, and city going forward. Uh, talk to us about what's happening in terms of standards of learning reform. There was there were some things that happened last year. There are things going on yet now. We're continuing. Standards of learning was a was a very aggressive uh, topic for us to be able to make sure that our students were learning things that everybody felt was important. Virginia was a leader in that direction. But one of the things that's occurred over time is we've become too focused on just the standards of learning. And I think there's a consensus that we need to scale some of those tests back. Not that we don't have some basic standards and minimums in place, but that we include more opportunities for teachers to teach about creative thinking and problem solving. And so we're trying to continue to scale back the standardized testing as we go forward in the standards of learning and build in some flexibility to the test. Technology creates all kinds of opportunities. So now if somebody is testing well, the test can, we can put in place that they can be tested in a more critical direction. Or if they're not testing well, we can put in place uh, a test that uh, takes into account those factors as well so we can tailor education to students while making sure we have a, have a basic positive level. Got about a minute left, but I want you to have an opportunity to tell our viewers what you think will happen in terms of ethics reform. I think that we'll pass some ethics legislation moving forward. One of the things that we really want to make sure in the bill that passed out of the Senate was a lot of the concerns and discussions have been about the executive branch and the governor and what they can and cannot do. And, and we have included that in, in this ethics reform package. The governor previously veto, vetoed some items that we included last year, and we wanted to be very aggressive in that. Plus, I think there will be a very, very aggressive gift cap to make sure that legislators are not taking gifts, but not to punish organizations like Aruitan or Rotary if you want to go and they give you a pen or or invite you to a breakfast or dinner meeting. So balancing those things will be coming forward, but I think ethics reform will be an aggressive package that will pass the legislature. Great. Well, thank you for being here, Senator Ryan McDougall. Good luck in the rest of the session. Thank you, Woody. Have a great day. Great. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm-hmm.